Recently, America and the world lost one of its preeminent leaders, Secretary Colin Powell. Welcome to the Empowerment Zone with Ramona Houston, where we zone in on black and brown relations and our journey to empowering our communities. Secretary Powell devoted his life to serving America in multiple capacities as a four-star general, national security advisor, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and secretary of the U.S. Department of State. And today we're celebrating the life and legacy of Secretary Colin Powell. I'm so honored to have career ambassador Catherine Canavan as our guest today. Ambassador Canavan was a Foreign Service Officer with the U.S. Department of State for more than 35 years. She served all over the world, Germany, Botswana, Kingdom of Lesotho, Namibia, Mexico, Jamaica, and others. And prior to entering the Foreign Service, she was a Peace Corps volunteer in Zaire. Ambassador Canavan had the honor of working directly with Colin Powell when he served as Secretary of the U.S. Department of State. Ambassador Canavan spent four years as the Director of the Foreign Service Institute, FSI, where she was responsible for successfully implementing Secretary Colin Powell's numerous training initiatives. Ambassador Canavan retired after a distinguished career in November of 2011 with the rank of career minister, the second highest in the Foreign Service. Thank you so much for joining us today, uh, Ambassador Canavan. Welcome to the Empowerment Zone. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Houston. It's lovely to be here and especially to have a chance to talk about um, Secretary Colin Powell, who we lost last week. And um, there's been so much written about him and uh, accolades um, about him in the last week that um, I hope to be able to bring um, some of my personal views on working very closely for him for three and a half years and um, what a special person he was to the State Department and diplomacy uh, in general. You know, you're one of the few people that I know that worked directly with uh, Secretary Powell and he has such a legacy, you know, uh, within uh, the Department of State, I know. Uh, a lot of people talk very highly of him, but few got to work with him directly. So what was that like? Um, it was it was actually quite wonderful. It started um, um, about, it started in March of 2001. He, of course, had been named Secretary of State by um, George W. Bush and was confirmed, I think, either the day after or the day after that, after um, President Bush had been inaugurated. And um, they were um, staffing various positions uh, within the State Department. I received a call. I had, I already had an assignment or I thought I had an assignment <laughs> <laughs> to work for the Director General of the Foreign Service, Mark Grossman. I was gonna be one of his deputies. So I was all set to do that. I was coming out of Lesotho as an ambassador and very much looking forward to this assignment. Then I learned that Mark had been chosen by Secretary Powell to be undersecretary for political affairs, which is the number three position in the State Department. Very important. And the fact that it was a um, career officer doing this, um, somebody I knew well was great, but that meant that the director general position was open. And Ambassador Ruth Davis was selected uh, to go into that position. And she brought two of her people that had been working with her at the Foreign Service Institute with her. So all of a sudden I realized um, 
I didn't have a job. <laughs> <laughs> so a few days later, um, my phone rang in Lesotho, which is in Southern Africa, way down in Southern Africa. And I, it was uh, Undersecretary for Management Grant Green, who's very close personally and professionally with Secretary Powell. And we chatted for about 15 minutes. And then he said, um, you know, we're playing musical chairs here in Washington. And I said, yes, sir. I was kind of wondering what that meant for me. And he said, well, um, how would you like to be director of the Foreign Service Institute? Well, that was my dream job. And I, it took me not even a nanosecond to say, oh, I would love to do that. And he said, well, you're my choice. Um, I've talked to a number of people and based on our short conversation we've had. I think you'd uh, be great for the job, but this is an important position for Secretary Powell, and he wants to meet with you before the assignment is set in concrete. Well, I said, you know where I am. <laughs> and he said, yes, uh, we'd like you to fly back to Washington and meet with the secretary. And uh, he, he said, uh, when would that be convenient? And I said, well, when is it convenient for the secretary to meet with me? So it turned out um, it was gonna be about a week later. So I flew all the way back to Washington. That's about 19 hours in the air and had to fly through Europe. And it, it took a while to get back. So I got back there and I was supposed to have a 15 minute meeting with the secretary. It lasted about half an hour and we chatted about a variety of things. And he said, well, you've got the job. So then I chatted with deputy secretary, uh, Rich Armitage, who was um, uh, also a good friend and professional colleague of the secretary's. And the person who would be my immediate supervisor, uh, Grant Green. And uh, we discussed when I would be able to get there and um, a bit about the secretary's expectations for training. Um, just the fact that he wanted to meet with the person who was going to be the director of training for uh, the State Department. Um, told me, as I said, told me a great deal about his interest and his concern about training. Um, I'm not sure any other secretary, perhaps George Schultz, would have been personally interested in who was going to be director of uh, FSI, but it was clear that it was high on the secretary's agenda. Uh, one of the things I learned at this meeting, uh, which took place in early April, of 2001 was that the secretary was going to double the intake uh, mm -hmm. of the foreign service. We had, um, we were very short staffed because of, first of all, we filled, we opened a whole bunch of new embassies and consulates uh, with the demise of the Soviet Union. And then um, with the Clinton administration, there had been a, um, an effort to uh, keep the budget under control. So the then Secretary of Management decided to cut back on intake from about 200 a year, which was attrition in the Foreign Service, to about 90 a year. And that went on for three years. So a combination of those two left us very short staffed. We did not have enough Foreign Service officers or Foreign Service people um, to fill the positions uh, that we had. So the secretary wanted to remedy that problem. And he also wanted to make sure that we had what the military calls a training float of about 15% over the number of positions you have. Because when you have people changing uh changing assignments, moving from one place to another and requiring training in between those assignments, um, that right there can leave a gap. So the secretary immediately said, we're doubling intake. And that was going to start in January of uh, 2002. So I came on board in June of 2001. So we had about seven months 
to get our act together to double the training facilities, <clears throat> to double the courses that new uh, employees were going to have to have when they first came in the service, the orientation course, language courses, functional training that they were going to need. And um, so we had to go to work right away. In some cases, it required um, physically changing the size of classrooms uh, to accommodate all of these new people. The secretary assured me that whatever um, funding we needed to do that, we would have. And so I had to go right to work, um, making sure that <clears throat> we were prepared to double the intake we had. Um, the secretary had staff meetings every morning at 830. They were um, designed not to last longer than half an hour. Frequently, they were 20, 25 minutes. Uh, they started on time and um, the secretary was extremely punctual, obviously a holdover from his military <laughs> career because the State Department and the Foreign Service isn't always known for being so punctual, but we learned that it was important that we arrive in the conference room um, at least 10, maybe even 15 minutes ahead of time. First of all, it gave us an opportunity to talk to our colleagues informally um, <clears throat> every day. And that was hugely helpful. But then we were all seated and ready to go when the secretary uh, came in. And actually we were standing when he came in, but then we sat down. Mm -hmm. There were actually 50 people in the room because it was all of the assistant secretaries, um, all of the undersecretaries. I, my position, while not um, requiring confirmation, was an assistant secretary <clears throat> equivalent position. And there were others such as the um, legal advisor, the uh, EEOC director, um, and there were a number of other folks who uh, were assistant secretary level um, or above who did not require confirmation. So his chief of staff was there um, and there were about 50 of us in the room and the secretary would come in and he would, he ha always had a list of things he wanted to say to us uh, for the day. Sometimes um, they were, um, giving us some information on how his day had gone the previous uh, day, um, things that had happened at the White House or otherwise, <coughs> excuse me. But then he would um, open it up for comments. And since there were so many of us in the room, um, you didn't say anything unless it was really important. So I usually didn't, uh, I usually didn't speak. Um, but um, on a couple of occasions, I had um, things I needed to tell him. And <clears throat> one time, he had a very good sense of humor, by the way, and he did like to tease people. Um, the Foreign Service Institute had been working very hard on distance education, particularly distance education programs um, for language both for people to be able to <clears throat> learn languages while they were assigned outside the department. <coughs> Excuse me, I should have gotten myself some water. Um, languages outside the department, but um, also to keep up their language skills while they were overseas, while they were working on it. So um, the German department had come up with an interactive language program, which was really excellent. You would actually have a conversation <clears throat> with the person and they would be able to correct your pronunciation or your grammar or whatever uh, that was going on. And so the department, the language department put the course on a CD for me to present to the secretary. So during the staff meeting, when it came around to me, I stood up and I handed him the CD and I said, uh, explained what it was. And he was very excited. You probably know that the secretary was actually kind of a geek. 
Um, he loved uh, systems <clears throat> and he had upgraded our computers in the State Department, um, brought us from maybe the 1980s into uh, the 21st century uh, on computers, gave us access to the internet, all kinds of um, important things for communication. So he was very excited about this. Um, the next day at staff meeting, when it came around to me, he handed me back the CD and said, this didn't work. And I thought, oh boy. And I said, well, sir, I will find out what the problem is and get back to you. <clears throat> so after the meeting was over, I immediately went to talk to his, he had his own system staff. And I said, what happened? And they said, oh, um, we disabled Java Writer on his personal laptop because it has so much spam. <clears throat> and our um, language programs were written on Java Writer. So his, it wouldn't work on his computer. So the next day I brought it back to him and I s explained what happened. And he looked around the room and he said, do you think she really knows what she's talking about? <laughs> and I said, sir, usually I, I wouldn't. In this case, I do. And uh, so I think if your, your staff now has a laptop that this will work on. So anyway, that was, that was one of the things. But he really, um, he cared about the organization so much. Um, most secretaries, and I came in the Foreign Service when Henry Kissinger was Secretary of State. And my experience with the secretaries is that um, they saw their job primarily as the foreign policy advisor to the president, not the person who was supposed to run an organization with 75,000 employees. And they delegated that to um, other members of their staff, um, which sent a message um, that they, you know, they weren't as engaged with the employees of the State Department, both foreign service and civil service, as well as our um, foreign nationals that we hire overseas. And the secretary was, Secretary Powell was clearly different. Um, he was very much hands-on as far as managing the department. He did not bring his own little coterie of advisors from the outside with him. In fact, very few of the senior staff were not career, uh, either foreign service or civil service. Um, in the department when I when he was the secretary, and because he said you're my you're my special advisors, you're the people who know the most about these issues, and that meant a great deal to um, to the employees to know that their knowledge, their professionalism was valued by the secretary and taken advantage of by him. There's nothing more empowering for employees than to feel that they are really contributing to whatever the mission of the organization is. And uh, Secretary Powell made us feel that way. Other secretaries have said that's what they wanted to do. Um, I don't wanna name names, but <laughs> Um, they, um, they didn't practice what they preached in, that, in those cases. And, uh, but Secretary Powell did. And even people who were some of the Foreign Service officers were not wild about the fact that um, Powell was um, his, professionally a military person. Uh, they were a bit afraid that maybe he would try to make the State Department into more of a military organization. I think with the exception of um, making us more punctual. <laughs> um, uh, and there were a few other things. He, he tried to make our 
evaluation system a little less cumbersome, um, which it needed. Um, you have experience with that. So <laughs> you know how, um, how wordy we can be sometimes. And he, he tried to, um, to remedy some of those issues. But what he did was, was empower people and he supported people. He told um, new ambassadors who were going out that until they proved otherwise, he had complete faith in their ability to represent the United States and our policies um, to the host government um, professionally and, um, and with full understanding of, of what those policies should be. Um, he did fire six ambassadors, um, three non-career and three career officers, but he did it because they didn't take care of their people. Um, they didn't treat them well. Um, they, they yelled, they, 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 were, they did not treat their employees uh, the way the secretary felt they should be treated. And so he, he took action on that. Um, and looking after your people, which is something that is extremely important in the military, was, was definitely something that he brought with him uh, to the job. And um, we found it extremely, um, we found him extremely supportive of whatever issue uh, we had. And he did a number of, um, of things. Um, you may be aware that the USAA insurance is, um, is specifically for the military, but foreign service officers had been eligible to uh, participate in the insurance because they had um, presidential commissions just like military officers. Um, but enlisted military were also um, could avail themselves of, of USAA resources as well. And, but our foreign service staff uh, were not able to. So the secretary picked up the phone and called the CEO of USAA and said, who was a friend of his, um, and had probably worked for Powell at some point in his career. Um, he said, you know, you need to include uh, foreign service um, uh, specialists, as well as foreign service officers in uh, your programs. And it happened. Um, he, it, as I mentioned, uh, he upgraded our computer systems. Um, we had had the same Wang computers for 10 years. When, right after they uh, got the State Department contract, Wang went bankrupt and went out of business. Hmm. So for 10 years, we had no software or hardware updates on our computers. So by the time the secretary came in, in 2001, we were hopelessly outdated in our computer systems. And he went to Congress and got the money to completely upgrade um, all of the systems that we have got us on internet, et cetera. And uh, that was huge. Um, he was not afraid to go to the Hill and argue for resources for the State Department. And um, we all knew about that. We knew what he was accomplishing for us. And that was extremely important. It sounds like, uh, you know, uh, Colin Powell was, Secretary Powell was really about building the institution of the Department of State. And when you look at his work there, what would you say are some of his last lasting legacies? Like, how is he different from the other um, secretaries that served that makes him have a unique legacy? Um, well, first of all, his um, empowering uh, the employees. Um, when he was, we were going to have a visit from the Mexican president. This is a story that's been told a number of times. 
early in uh, his tenure, um, he didn't just ask the assistant secretary for briefing materials. He personally called uh, the desk officer for Mexico mm -hmm. and had all of the there was, there was a senior desk officer, but there were several other desk officers and included them in the uh, planning and briefing section, uh, sessions for not only himself, but uh, for the White House as well. Um, again, that sort of thing is, is extremely empowering. Um, he, because of the fact that he got these resources, some of which are ongoing, again, with, um, with our systems. Um, one of his biggest, because I was involved in it, I think one of his most important legacies is the training that he mandated for the State Department. State Department has um, partially because we never had that training float to have the extra staff to take advantage of training opportunities the way the military did, um, we, we didn't have leadership courses, for instance, until you got to be very senior uh, in the department. He saw that as a, a, real, um, a real problem, a real issue. And he mandated that for both foreign service and civil service, there should be, um, there should be leadership and management courses throughout your career. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, in, for the Foreign Service, you're not, even if you're recommended for promotion, you can't get the promotion unless you've taken the requisite leadership course <clears throat> to move on to the next level. And um, the emphasis on distance education and distance training opportunities uh, for folks who um, aren't in Washington because it's very expensive to bring people back mm -hmm. from overseas for anywhere from, you know, for what, whatever amount of time um, you're paying travel expenses and the time away from your post overseas uh, when there may not be um, a, very many people to fill in for you while you're gone. It, it's hard for you to do that or between assignments. So his um, insistence on various kinds of training um, that and mandated that are still going on is something that will always um, will always be there and is an important legacy. Uh, for um, to remember him by, and that um, even folks who did not have a chance to serve when he was secretary uh, are benefiting from these um, technology uh, training opportunities. Um, trying to make sure that that our staffing is is adequate. Um, secretaries who followed him have also have tried to follow his lead in making sure that um, the State Department and the Foreign Service is properly staffed and that um, that we're that we have the support we need uh, to do our jobs overseas. Um, that's getting harder. He he was also there during a time where we were able to upgrade the security of many of our embassies overseas. Um, terrorism was clearly an issue. So many of our embassies were in older buildings that didn't have proper security, didn't have setbacks. Um, he went to the Hill to make sure that we had the resources uh, to build new buildings, um, some of them, some people think are not the most beautiful ones, <laughs> but they are more secure. secure. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is an important legacy of his um, that everybody uh, benefits from. 
So who were some of his team members? You talked about the fact that he only brought a few uh, people yeah. uh, with him as his senior advisors. Who were yeah. some of his advisors and how did they run the department differently than um, secretaries before him? Um, the deputy secretary was Rich Armitage, uh, who'd also been in the military and um, Powell had worked with, um, knew him very well. Um, and um, Rich was very much on the same wavelength as Secretary Powell as far as um, uh, empowering, enabling, um, supporting uh, the department and the employees. Um, he had selected Mark Grossman to be the Undersecretary for Political Affairs. Um, Mark and I came in the Foreign Service together, so we knew each other. And he was the Director General I was gonna be working with. So when he was moved up, the Undersecretary for Political Affairs is uh, the th number three in the department. And then uh, the next most important Undersecretary is the Undersecretary for Management. And Secretary Powell brought with him a close personal and professional friend, uh, also who had also been in the military, uh, Grant Green. Grant was my immediate um, supervisor. And um, the Secretary, uh, Deputy Secretary Armitage, Undersecretary Grossman, and Undersecretary Green met every afternoon to talk about. Um, how the day had gone, what had happened, uh, who was doing well, who was maybe not doing so well. It was not so much a, um, I'm sure they discussed various policy issues uh, um, from time to time, but it was primarily an opportunity for them to talk about how the department um, was moving forward on um, a number of leadership and management issues, including things like filling senior appointments and um, making sure that um, the right people were in the right jobs and that sort of thing. And they were very hands-on when it came to um, when it came to that sort of thing. And that was very much appreciated by um, people in the department. Yes, so, always, uh, when I was um, a, a public member of the Foreign Service Selection Board, I would hear stories uh, from people from different people who are on my board saying, you know, that he was very personable, like you stated, he was empowering of, you know, people in the foreign service that he would often end up in the uh, cafeteria and walk yes. around. I've, I've yeah. heard all of those stories that he was a very personable person. Yes, um, he, he told a funny story on himself one time. He, when he did, went on these walkabouts around the department, he would try to lose his um, protective detail that usually went around with him. And um, one time he was able to, I guess, sneak out the back door of his office. And he got in the, instead of the secretary's elevator, because he had his own personal elevator, um, he got in the regular elevator. And he, um, during the day when he wasn't in a meeting with a foreign dignitary or uh, wasn't leaving the building to go to a meeting at the White House, for instance, he would wear a windbreaker. So he had his, his shirt and tie and a navy blue windbreaker on that had the Department of State seal and his name um, embroidered on it. So he got in this elevator one time and there was one other woman in the elevator with him and he had decided to ride all the way down the, to the basement, the garage with her. And he was talking to her about her job. And, and uh, she said, well, she was, um, she was able to leave early today um, because she had a, a what the, she was working on, what they called compressed time. So she would work longer some days and then was able to take other days off. And he said, oh, he said, hmm, that sounds interesting. How, how do you get to do that? And she said, um, well, you have to get your supervisor's approval. 
And she said, you know, you ought to try that. <laughs> it was it was clear to him that she didn't realize who it was. <laughs> and he kept trying to turn to show her his name embroidered on his jacket so she would realize who she was talking to and she never did and she said she said yeah you ought to talk to your your supervisor and he said he said well I'm not sure how President Bush would feel about that and she said well you ought to try talking to him <laughs> and then she got out the elevator and <laughs> But it was it was very funny because he said, I guess some people don't recognize me in the building. Um, anyway, it was it was very funny. But he would he he took pride in attending um, as many ceremonies as he could, specifically swearing in of new employees. And it didn't matter whether they were uh, uh, a group of Foreign Service Office Management Specialists or a group of, um, or individual ambassadors who were going out, uh, new foreign service class, um, new civil service class. He would try, if he was in the building and didn't have uh, a conflict, he would always be there. And it really meant a lot to the employees for him to uh, do that sort of thing. And um, he did get around quite a bit. Um, and one of the things I learned from him, and it was, this came up in a staff meeting one day. Um, as he was going around the room, one of, uh, one of the folks in the room said that they were having uh, an issue trying to organize something with another agency. And secretary said, well, you know, how long has this been going on and who are you talking to? And um, the person allowed is that this had been going on longer than they would have liked. And they seemed to be at an impasse. And the secretary said, you need to let me know these things. I'm, I'll pick up the phone and call the secretary of whatever it is, Homeland Security, Defense, um, Director of USAID, whoever it is that you're having issues with. And he said, that's my job. He said, yes, <clears throat> you all are here to support me, but I am also here to support you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you need me, don't feel that, you know, don't feel that it diminishes you if you have to ask me for help. That's my job, is to help you get things done. I mean, it's great if you can do it yourself, but if there's an impasse, let me know because that's my responsibility. Um, that was very important to me mm -hmm. to learn when I uh, went out as ambassador to Botswana um, after I left the Foreign Service Institute. Um, because in many cases, having the ambassador or the senior person of an organization show up in an event uh, and clearly support the activity or whatever the event was, um, Lee gives a lot of gravitas mm -hmm. to that organization, and it also um, empowers the person who's who's organizing it and who's responsible for it. So um, those were the kinds of lessons I learned from him. He, of course, in uh, his uh, second book, It Worked For Me, about his leadership and management, he has a whole list of, of things to do, you know, um, it's, it, it always, things are never as bad as you think. They always look better in the morning, except when they don't, <laughs> um, things like that. <clears throat> and, and he was just, he was so personable. Um, and he was, he was somebody who was, uh, delightful to work for. He did have his little quirks. Um, I remember one time we had, um, we had started on, on his behest, we had started a 
um, a course for new senior officers. You served on the board that helped select some of those officers. Well, in the first year after they'd been promoted, they were required to take a two week um, leadership course. And uh, through our leadership and management school and Ambassador Prue Bushnell, who was the Dean of that school, we had come up with um, really excellent uh, course. Wasn't quite as long or as comprehensive as we would have liked, but with the resources we had, it was, it was really a good course. And um, there was a reading list that came along with it. And secretary asked to see the reading list one time. So I gave it to him and uh, the next day he came back and he said, uh, I want you to take off this one book. It was Daniel Goldman's um, uh, Emotional Intelligence. And uh, he said, I, 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 don't like, I don't like the title. I don't, I don't like it, get rid of it. And I said, um, have, I said, have you read the book? He said, no, I don't, not with a title like that. I don't need to read it. And I said, well, before you actually order us to take it off the reading list, you probably should read it because you're the poster child for emotional intelligence. And he looked a little perplexed and then went away and we never heard anything more. <laughs> so, he didn't say, okay, you can leave it on. He just never said anything else. So um, anyway, so, I mean, he had, he had his own, um, he had his own views on certain issues. Um, and it was, it was actually very helpful. Um, I had a very good relationship with uh, Undersecretary Green, who was my immediate supervisor. And I knew he used to have a secretary every day, sometimes more than once. And so I could run ideas past him and see whether it would be something that the secretary would think was a good idea for us to do at the Foreign Service Institute. So one day I, it was, I, I saw Grant after our Powell's morning staff meeting. And I asked him, I said, you know, we're thinking about doing so-and-so. What do you think? Would the secretary think this is a good idea? And he said, oh, no. He said, do not do that. <laughs> no, do not. I said, okay. I guess we'll forget about that idea. <laughs> it's good you had somebody to run it by before you gave it to the secretary. Absolutely. Right? <laughs> Absolutely. So, but he, he, um, we had um, we had had two retired ambassadors who were running our ambassadorial seminar, and they had done a really excellent job um, for about eleven years. Um, they took it from kind of a what we used to call a charm course to a really substantive course for new ambassadors. But we now had a leadership and management school, and we had the resources to run the course ourselves without needing to hire um, mm -hmm. outside contractors. Mm -hmm. So when their contract was up, I called these two ambassadors in and I let them know that uh, we were not gonna be renewing the contract, um, not just for them, but not for anybody because we were bringing it in the house and how much we had appreciated uh, the work they had done all those years. And it was, you know, it was the basis for what we were going to be doing in the future, but we needed to make some, um, we needed to make some changes in the course updates and things like that. So, so anyway, they were a little stunned <laughs> and they were both, uh, they both knew Secretary Powell very well. So um, after about a week later, the secretary called me over after staff meeting and said, uh, what, what's this about your, you know, firing these guys? <laughs> and I said, no, we didn't fire them. I said, their contract was up and um, we're able to run the ambassadorial seminar uh, ourselves now at the Foreign Service Institute. They've done a wonderful job. I told them that. 
And, um, but, you know, we can do this with our own resources now. And, you know, they've, they've pretty much been doing the same course for 11 years and we need to make some major updates and which they weren't quite ready to, um, mm -hmm. to work on. And he said, oh, okay, that's fine. So, you know, as soon as he had gotten one story. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, but he was, you know, he, he understood what we were trying to do and, uh, and approved of that. So um, he, was, he was very supportive of innovation, as I said, particularly in the area of technology, distance education, um, that sort of thing. And um, it, it made a huge difference. Being able to get resources to hire the right people, to um, make physical changes in our campus that we needed to, and that sort of thing. Um, that kind of support is um, not always forthcoming because in many cases, if the secretary isn't prepared to go to Congress to, um, to argue, uh, to convince the Hill that um, we need the we need the resources, then um, we don't get them. Mm -hmm. He so. sounds like, you know, one of those leaders, like you stated, there are many characteristics that he had that you could model, uh, that you yes. could, could, could learn from. As far as my experience with Colin, uh, Secretary Powell, uh, I was introduced to Secretary Powell when I was a freshman, I think, in college or a sophomore in college. Uh -huh. He was the commencement speaker. And I was like, who is this? I had never heard of him. I'm from a small yeah. town, a small country town. And so uh -huh. um, that was my introduction to him. But when I served as a public member of the Foreign Service uh, Selection Board, one of my board members, I don't, I, I don't remember which board it was. It was probably the first time I served on the board, which right. was 2003. Um, yeah. They actually, um, the board made a way for me to go to one of the press conferences uh -huh. so I could see uh, him in action. And so that right. was the, uh, so I got to attend one of the press conferences that he had. Um, um, but that, that uh, is my limited experience yeah. uh, with uh, Secretary Powell, but it is so good to hear the stories behind the man and how he changed how the Foreign Service operates, how he was a hands-on person, how he was uh, how he listened to his people, you yes. know, and, and, you know, when you get to that level, sometimes you think, you know, more than what, you know, but right. uh, he actually listened to his team and really considered um, all of the uh, input you all had. And then not only that built his team around people who were in the foreign yes. service. We, we did have a few um, non-career people uh, professionals. Richard Haas was the director of the policy planning staff Paula Dobriansky, who is wonderful, uh, served as the undersecretary for global issues. Um, John Bolton, who was a protege of Vice President Cheney's, was the undersecretary for arms control. Um, <clears throat> but as I said, for the most part, uh, his senior staff were um, career foreign service and civil service people in the State Department. And um, it was, um, you know, the sad part is it was an opportunity for us to experience what could be, uh, but hasn't always been, and has not always been, has even in the future has not always been. Uh, we were, I consider myself hugely fortunate uh, to have been in the right place at the right time to be able to work for him um, and to have, <clears throat> have worked in an area that was so important to him uh, that he, um, he included me uh, in, in a lot of things. And it was, um, it was a great experience. Uh, really, after that, I figured I, done all the cool jobs in Washington <laughs> that I ever wanted to do. So <laughs> yeah, I couldn't think of a better one. And having been there 
after, during 9-11 was, that was a huge, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it was really important to all of us that um, the support that he gave um, everybody in the, in the Foreign Service in the State Department. Mm -hmm. So um, it was, it was unique. Um, it was a great learning experience for all of us. Um, there were a number of leadership and management things that I think I already knew a little about, but he was able to really articulate them. Uh, you were talking about um, watching him at a press conference. He would frequently be given a speech to make somewhere. And he might start off with the beginning of the speech and then he would put the speech aside and he would speak extemporaneously. Hmm. And he may be the best extemporaneous speaker I've ever heard. Hmm. Um, in many cases, he was talking about issues that were near and dear to his heart and he knew what he wanted to say and he was able, he really connected with the, um, the audience. Um, one time I, I helped organize with the Army War College, a, um, a chair at the Army War College, uh, the Colm Powell, um, basically national security, international relations chair. And when the chair was gonna be endowed, um, I was able, along with one of the secretary staff, to um, take a helicopter to Carlisle, Pennsylvania, to um, for this this ceremony. And um, first of all, it was interesting because even as the Secretary of State, he had to have a senior Pentagon official with us in the helicopter to get to get the helicopter. So anyhow, so we, he and I and a uh, member of his staff drove over in, the, um, in his car to uh, the Pentagon to catch the helicopter. And we flew the, <clears throat> to the Army War College at Carlisle. And after he had gotten through the sort of introductions and thanking various people <clears throat> at the beginning, he put the speech aside and, and spoke um, extemporaneously for about 45 minutes. Wow. And it was, it was really brilliant. And the War College students who were there and the faculty who were there, uh, um, it, it meant so much to them that, um, that he had come and all the things that he talked about. Um, it was, I mean, it was brilliant. It was brilliant. Well, we surely appreciate uh, you sharing uh, these wonderful stories and just telling us more about the man, you know, the icon that we know, this diplomat, this, this, um, this man who really meant a lot to a lot of people and really left a uh, lifetime of achievements and a legacy that uh, that we really appreciate all of the work that he's done for us in the United States and around the world. Thank you very much, Dr. Houston. Um, people of his caliber don't come along very often. And um, it was a real honor for me, not just to work for him, but to be able to talk to you and your um, all the people who listen to your podcast today about um, this really great individual and uh, for whom so many of us have uh, huge uh, admiration and um, we need more of him, yes. people like him. Yes. Thank so, you so much, Ambassador you. Kate Canavan. Appreciate you. Take care. Bye-bye. A special thank you to the incredible team of the Empowerment Zone. Terry Gully, theme song, NADWORKS, digital support, and of course, our featured guest. If you enjoyed my podcast, please.
please subscribe. We are on all of your favorite podcast platforms. Be sure to rate us on Apple Podcasts too. Thank you for your continued support.